Hi, good morning everyone and um, thanks very much for joining our webinar today. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping to start off with. If you're unable to hear or see the presentation at any point, uh, please enter a question using the webinar toolbar uh, and a colleague will investigate for you straight away. Okay, let me start by introducing myself. I'm Claire Tasker and I'm part of the account team here at the Coal Authority. Uh, so what are we going to be talking about today? So today's webinar is all about the Coal Authority's consultants report and how this particular report can help support development on coal field areas. Our main goal during today's webinar uh, will be to review the consultants report using a real life case study helping to draw attention to the value of the report. And we'll also delve a little deeper into the report itself uh, to give you an overview of what information you could expect to see. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar or equally at the end when a quick survey will appear. And we'll look to respond to everyone after this month's topic has been completed uh, by way of a, a handy FAQ document that captures all questions uh, so that everybody can benefit. I'll also supply you with my contact details at the end uh, to enable you to contact me directly should you wish to do so with any additional questions. Before we look at today's agenda, uh, let's just start with a quick recap of our previous webinars. Last month, we looked at how our reports can help you to interpret hidden risks, uh, focusing on our suite of recommended follow-on reports. Uh, which deal with detailed information on mine entries, uh, subsidence claims, etc. In February, uh, we took a really close look at the official CON 29M report, going through each section in detail, uh, and both of these were presented in the context of, of a case study featuring mineshaft collapses that the authority has dealt with under its statutory responsibilities. If you missed these sessions uh, and would like to bring yourself up to speed on any of the content, uh, you can watch these at a time that's convenient for you uh, by finding the recordings on our YouTube channel. And you can see the channel address in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. All of our webinars are recorded and stored on our YouTube channel, so keep your eyes peeled for, for further ones appearing, uh, including today's, over the coming weeks and months. So the agenda for today is as follows. Uh, we're going to kick things off uh, with another one of our real life case studies. Uh, this time a shallow workings collapse in, in Dunfermline in Scotland. We'll then move on to comparing the information in the official CON 29M uh, non-residential report against what you would see within the consultant's report. Uh, we'll look at an example of each report for the location featured in the case study. Uh, to highlight the ways that the different types of coal mining risks are presented in the different reports. We'll then cover the deeper detail held within the consultant's report and what information you can expect to see within each section of that report. And we'll finish everything off uh, by summarising a few key facts of the consultant's report. Right, let's get started with the case study. The collapse we're going to look at today uh, was reported to us back in 2014 on Saturday the 15th of March and it took place on an unused piece of land uh, near to a disused railway line up in Dunfermline. As with many surface hazards on the coal field, uh, this one was brought to the attention of our Public Safety and Subsidence, or PSNS for short, uh, that team. Uh, when the local emergency service had been made aware of the whole picture uh, as a potential danger. And it was them who contacted us using our uh, dedicated hazard hotline, which is manned by us 24-7. This call was taken outside of normal working hours by one of our PSNS duty officers. And the collapse was around 5 metres deep and 4 metres in diameter and was caused by a collapse of shallow coal mine workings at the location, most probably of the Loch Gelly splint seam, which was last worked at a shallow depth in the 1850s. 
and it's the statutory responsibility of our PSNS team to manage all coal mining related surface hazards. So it's this team who would take control and manage any occurrences like this. So a bit of background on the land itself. As you can see from the picture on screen, uh, the land in question was pretty wet and had been heavily waterlogged for some time uh, prior to the collapse being spotted. And once the water level had reduced, the collapse uh, pictures was revealed. You can also see on screen how, how water was draining into the void and exacerbating the situation and causing further instability around the collapse. As safety is always our first priority, uh, we deployed our competent contractors, Mines Rescue Service, to site immediately, and they arrived within the hour. Once on site, they met with the emergency services and supervised our regionally based framework of contractors, ensuring the area was fenced off and made safe. Uh, now, we've worked with the Mines Rescue Service for a, a good number of years now, and their regional presence on the coal field uh, mirrors that of our own regional project managers. And we all work very closely together to provide a seamless service as a as first response to any coal mining related hazards. Mines Rescue prepared an initial visit report, including photos of the site uh, and liaised directly with stakeholders on our behalf, uh, whilst keeping in close contact with the appropriate duty officer at the Coal Authority. Now, for those of you who have attended our, our previous webinars over the past couple of months, uh, you've, you'd have noticed that we've focused on, on residential areas. With this one, however, uh, the collapse took place in a, a different setting. The location in question, as well as a large surrounding area, has recently been purchased for development. The plan for the, for the land included building a number of residential properties, uh, commercial buildings, local community buildings and the creation of several open space areas as well. Once the site had been made safe, uh, we contacted the developers to make them aware of what had happened and then we requested their permission to undertake uh, required treatment works to the collapse. Mm -hmm. Following this work and having become comfortable that the collapse posed no further immediate risks, we kick-started our investigations. Here at the Coal Authority, we have the UK's most advanced database of coal mining information. And it's this database which always forms the main part of our investigations. From the offset, the database will tell us the details of any known abandoned mines, uh, shaft locations for those mines, uh, the coal seams that have been worked, any geological anomalies, and any previous subsidence claims or past coal-related incidents uh, in the area. Now, calling your attention to the image on screen, uh, the circle highlighted with the red arrow is where the collapse had occurred. Using our database, we could instantly see that there were past underground coal mine workings recorded at the site. And this is the hatched area you can see on the image on screen. This included some workings that were very near the surface and uh, over 150 years old. We could also see that due to the geology in the area, there were coal outcrops uh, where coal strata is located near the surface, meaning there may have been some unrecorded historic workings. It's worth noting at this stage that prior to the 1872 Act of Parliament, which made it a legal requirement to maintain accurate mine plans, with a final abandonment plan to be deposited once the mine had been closed, the unrecorded extraction of coal did take place, and this is why the Coal Authority provides an indication of this hidden risk in its report, alongside any recorded workings which were carried out after the introduction of this legal requirement. And we could also see, as part of our investigations, uh, that there were recorded mine shafts in the wider area, uh, which you can see marked as the target circles on the screen. So to treat the collapse, uh, we scheduled works with our regionally based contractors in Scotland. They used an excavator to further expose the workings collapse and associated voids. 
Uh, we then used 100 tonnes of 40 mil recycled stone, and this was packed into the void and the collapse. And we also reinstated the topsoil and sowed grass seed to return the site to its original condition as much as possible. The collapse has also caused damage to a, a field drain on site that was causing problems with water. And this was also repaired prior to the final reinstatement. So here you can see the end result uh, once all the groundworks have been completed. We did experience some delay in carrying out works on, on this one, as it's really key that we work with landowners and need their permission to undertake any works. And sometimes uh, obtaining this permission can take a number of months. Now that repair works have been carried out, uh, we have updated our database. And this now shows us a surface hazard that we have treated on all of our reports. We at the Coal Authority pride ourselves on having the most up-to-date and high-tech coal mining database in the UK. And this can only be achieved by ensuring it, it remains up-to-date through importing any new information that comes to light. All of this is undertaken by our expert uh, mining data managers on site, who are some of the best at, some of the best at what they do, uh, ensuring unrivaled accuracy with any new entries into our database. So that concludes the case study. So what we're going to do now is, is take a bit of a poll to find out which reports you purchase uh, when dealing with non-residential areas of land or we're looking to do site investigations or risk assessments on the coal field. What will happen, uh, a new screen will pop up with a question, and if you could use the radio buttons on there to vote, it would be really, it'd be really interesting for us to see which reports uh, people use. So on to the question we'd like to ask. Which report do you purchase when planning developments? So here comes uh, the poll screen. I'll just give you a few moments to vote. Um, this is great feedback for us, so we'd really appreciate you letting us know which reports you do purchase. If it's the um, CON29M non-residential report, or in fact the consultant's report, or if you're dialing in today from the conveyancing department or search provider, you could perhaps answer this hypothetically based on your knowledge of the report. Okay, just give a, a few more moments. Right, so the majority of people have voted, so thanks very, thanks very much for that. What I'll do now is close the poll and let you have the results. So interestingly, uh, most of you have identified the CON29M, uh, non-residential, rather than the consultant's report. So thank you for that feedback. It would also be great for us to understand the, understand the reasons why you favor one rather than the other. So if you could perhaps provide a few words by the question facility in the toolbar or at the survey at the end of the webinar, this would really be valuable to us. And if you've uh, voted other as well, it, it would also be really useful for it to get an understanding of what that means as well. So thank you very much for that. Moving on, uh, what we're going to do now is walk you through how and where the risks associated with the case study we've just looked at are highlighted in both the official CON29M non-residential report but also how this is presented in the consultant's report. So now um, we're going to take you through some reports that have been produced for the location in Dunfermline that the case study related to. First up, uh, what we're looking at is the summary table from our non-residential official CON29M report. The summary table details out the, the questions set by the Law Society when undertaking property purchases uh, to ensure that due diligence is undertaken by the legal community. 
<clears throat> this table is a relatively new feature of the report and was added as part of the redesign that took place at the start of last year. You can see that based on the information in the COM 29 m uh, that it's extracted for this particular location, various questions are highlighted and they have the yes response in there. These relate to past shallow workings, uh, future underground coal mining, mine entries, past open cast coal mining, surface hazards and withdrawal of support. The summary page also details out relevant follow-on reports which can be purchased to get more information on individual specific mining risks such as mine entries and surface hazards. When looking at the information in the main body of the CON29M report, you can see on screen the information that appears in the report in relation to recorded workings. You can see that there are 10 um, themes of recorded workings um, beneath the site, uh, that some of these workings are shallow and 320 meters deep at their deepest. Turning to future workings, Although the location is not in an area where there has been a, a license granted by the coal authority uh, to mine in the future, the yes response relates to the fact that there are still measures of coal intact at the location, which potentially could be worked in future, uh, but the risk of this, uh, given the decline of the, the British coal mining industry, is, is minimal. Examining the statement on past coal mining in the CON29M more closely, where we report on coal workings that have occurred at shallow depth, there is a potential that surface instability could occur. Where we would issue a statement to this effect for reports featuring deep workings, we cannot confirm that ground movement associated with shallow workings should have stopped by now. And as the COM29M document is a legal document to assist those involved with the conveyancing process, we want to make sure that this potential risk is really drawn to people's attention in a clear, easy to understand way. And that's why we use the word shallow. In the consultant's report, however, uh, because of the different audience and use of the document, i.e. to support death studies and risk assessments, the full breakdown of the individual themes work is provided. And here you can see the example for the case study site in Dunfermline that we looked at. And this is a table featuring all the details of the recorded workings beneath the site or within a certain zone of influence of that site. Here we can see a close-up of the detail in the table, and you can see the extent to which the workings have been broken down, and that this is to a greater extent to the COM29M report. For example, rather than just stating that there are shallow workings at the location, these are broken down into individual panels within the seams. Here you can see some of the individual panels at different depths within seams, showing the full extent of the shallow workings. Turning now to mine entries, uh, let's compare how these compare in each of the reports. Here is a copy of the detailed information in the CON29M for mine entries. In the CON29M, you will get information on the number of mine entries within the boundary or within 20 meters. So here you can see that there were 13 in the boundary area or within 20 meters for that site that we looked at earlier. And if the information is available, it will provide details of any treatment or conveyance details for the highlighted shafts or adits. So for example, for this particular shaft out of the 13 mine entries, the shaft has been treated in the past, but unfortunately, we do not know to what extent that was treated. Conveyance or, or sold details are quite rare for mine entries, uh, but in the past, some of these have been sold to other parties, such as local authorities, and if this is, is the case, details will be provided in the report. 
in comparison, here is uh, the mine entry information included in the consultant's report. And the consultant's report looks at a wider area than the COM29M. It looks at the boundary identified plus a 100 metre area. So on that basis, more information is likely to be returned. Here you can see a close-up extract from the consultant's report. Uh, focusing in on a particular mine entry, uh, the report features the mine entry reference, its location given in the format of Eastings and Northings, uh, any treatment details, uh, the mineral, and in the majority of cases this will be coal, and any details if the mine entry has been sold. All the information for the mine entries is presented in a table for ease of reference. Now we're going to move away from the comparison of the reports and look in detail at all the sections within the consultant's report. The consultant's report is provided uh, to supply detailed information on recorded coal mine workings, mine entries and coal seam outcrops, together with a summary of information on other coal mining related risks. What we're going to do now is talk through what each of these sections actually mean and what information you can expect to receive in the consultant's report. The first area that's covered is any underground coal extraction. The report provides the name of the coal seam that has been worked and the colliery associated with workings. The mineral extracted, in the majority of cases, uh, this will be coal. However, we do sometimes report on additional minerals if, the, if these have been extracted in association with the coal workings. For example, some collieries in the past may have extracted ironstone as well as coal, uh, but coal was the main mineral worked. The panel reference uh, is an internal coal authority reference, uh, which means that we can plot individual pieces of workings uh, at different depths and dates uh, within a single coal seam. This reference can also be used if you need to talk to our mining information experts for more details. The depth uh, of the workings in the seam, uh, based on a number of uh, sources of various ages, scales and condition, is provided. Moving now to the direction and disposition of the workings, uh, for workings directly beneath the boundary provided, these will be presented as beneath the property. But rather than just show the workings directly underneath, we want people to be aware of those workings that may still have an impact on the site. So we show workings where the property in question is in a, a zone of influence of workings. The direction to the workings further afield are presented as north, south, etc. of the location in question. And the disposition of the workings, uh, so for so those workings directly beneath the property, uh, this will be presented as 0.0. For those further away from the property, uh, they will pr be presented as a ratio, which relates again to that zone of influence of the workings. And this is calculated by looking at, at a ratio of depth and distance from the workings to establish um, if the site fits within this wider zone of influence. Any workings that fit within a ratio of 0.7 will show in the report, along with their respective ratio. Now, the extraction thickness is shown in centimetres and relates to the thickness of the workings uh, in the seams. And the year that's shown uh, is that when the panel within the seam was last mined, based on the information that we have from the old abandonment plan. The report will confirm uh, whether there are any spine roadways recorded beneath the boundary provided. Um, these are passageways and, and tunnels um, in a fashion that connected workings or were used um, in drift mines. And as a result, these can often be found leading from uh, recorded adits that we report on or as connecting tunnels for, for deeper workings. The report will confirm whether or not there is evidence to suggest that there are probable but unrecorded shallow coal mine workings at the location provided. We will come on to outcrops on the next slide, uh, but these probable unrecorded workings, or what we call PRUG 
internally at the coal authority. I usually indicated when the coal strata in a particular area are, are relatively near to the surface. We want people to be aware of the potential hidden risks of unrecorded historic mining activity, so that's why we include this information. Any workings of this nature are likely to be historic and before the 1872 date that we mentioned before, uh, where records of workings were legally required. Due to their age, the mining techniques um, are also more likely to be more rudimentary and more likely to cause problems in terms of collapses. For example, using wooden staging for supports which deteriorate over time. Moving now to outcrops, uh, the consultant's report is unique in our suite as the only report that features these details. Outcrops uh, where the coal strata meets the surface uh, subject to any superficial deposits or, or made ground on top of these uh, and which can vary to a considerable degree throughout the country uh, are taken from geological plans and together with the indication of PRUG can help to build up the full picture of the coal mining situation at a particular site. Consultants report provides the, the name of the seam that is outcropping, uh, the mineral. Again, in the vast majority of cases, this will be coal. The thin indicator for outcrops is an indication of whether or not information indicates that the seam at this location is of a workable thickness. If not, uh, the thin indicator will be true. Generally, Coal seams uh, 0.5 metres and thicker will be considered as thick enough to have been viably worked by underground methods. We give details of the location of the outcrop compared to the location in terms of distance, uh, direction, and then give a bearing for the line of the outcrop. We report on outcrops within a 100 metre area of the boundary supplied. Moving now to any future underground mining, uh, this would now be a, a very rare occurrence given the position of the, the British coal industry now. But the Coal Authority is still set up to regulate what remains of the coal industry by issuing licences for coal extraction. And any details of this planned future mining would appear in the consultant's report. The details would include the colliery that we would be working the coal and the name of the seams to be worked the internal coal authority panel references for each seam to be worked, uh, the depth of the seams planned to be mined, the direction and disposition of the workings, again, if the area in question is within the potential zone of influence of those workings, the extraction thickness of the workings proposed and when the likely start and end dates are. Following on from the granting of licences to work coal in the future, the report would also provide more details specific to that licence. If we have granted a licence to, to another um, party to mine coal, they become the miner operator for the purposes of the Coal Mining Subsidence Act 1991, and the area undermined by their workings uh, will be designated an area of responsibility, or AOR for short. This has been more or less removed now, again, due to the decline of the coal mining industry. However, the report also includes any other licenses issued by the Coal Authority, such as for open cast sites. The consultant's report includes a type of license, i.e., is it for open cast workings or underground workings, uh, includes the name of the company that has applied for the license, it gives the current status, is it still current or is it a past license that is no longer in use. And then moving on to section 46 uh, notices uh, that are detailed in the report. Uh, section 46 refers to the section in the Coal Mining Subsidence Act 1991, which deals with notices to property owners. Where mining has been carried out, uh, this section states uh, that where it is was proposed to carry on any underground coal mining operations, uh, a mine operator would need to give owners or occupiers of any land which, which might be affected by subsidence as a result of those workings 
uh, they were to give them notice that there was a risk of their land being so affected. So the report will detail if any of these notices have been issued on the land within the boundary provided and confirm the address in respect of which these notices have been issued and, and also the dates of the notices that have been issued. Turning now to geology, the consultant's report details any geological lines of weakness that are present on the site in question. Uh, the report would also detail whether the line of weakness is a naturally occurring fault, uh, whether it is a fissure, uh, which is sometimes caused by collapses in deeper coal mine workings, which then migrate to the surface and present as, as a trench type line at the surface. Um, break lines are rarer, and this is really a coverall term, which may be a fissure or a fault. The report also um, includes court orders. So when we when we talk about court orders in this context, it refers to where an order was granted to either facilitate, to restrict, or prevent coal mine workings taking place, or what we call a working facilities order. For example, a mine operator could apply to the court for permission to mine if the mineral owner themselves could not be traced. And often in these cases, uh, provisions for making claims for subsidence damage were written into the, the orders and that can still remain valid to the present day. The report will detail the name of the mineral operator um, who applied for the court order and will also detail any amendments to the order that were made. We've uh, briefly touched on mine entries already, but just to recap uh, what's included in, in the consultant's report. So for all recorded mine shafts and addits, uh, you receive the following information uh, for entries within the boundary or within that 100 meters of the boundary. So you'll get details of the type of entry, whether it's a shaft or an addit, uh, the reference number for that, that mine entry, uh, the mine entry location really pinpointed given its eastings and northings and any treatments uh, that's been carried out to that mine entry so any past repairs carried out either by the coal authority itself <clears throat> or by a preceding body such as uh, the national coal board um, it will also detail the mineral mined used in the shaft or the adit again in the majority of cases this will be coal and whether the mine entry has been sold, and if so, any details of the sale. Turning now to open cast mining, uh, otherwise known as surface mining, which reflects the, the method of the coal extraction. The report will provide details if the boundary provided intercepts a recorded open cast site boundary or one within 200 meters. The presence of a previous open cast site can indicate that the site has been subject to backfill or, and, or made ground at the site at the location, uh, which can provide essential information when looking to develop a site. Coal mining related surface hazards, the likes of which we have discussed in the case study, uh, have their own section in the consultant's report. Uh, the idea of this section is to help highlight any remedial works that have been carried out by our PSNS team where a coal mining related hazard has been flagged. And the Coal Authority deals with over 1,000 surface hazards per year. And this can cover uh, various scenarios, uh, including mine shaft collapses, uh, the collapse of shallow workings uh, causing sinking of the ground, uh, those fissures in the ground we discussed earlier caused by deeper workings and can also include um, where, where entrances to mines, uh, shafts or adits are damaged or vandalized. The management and remediation of these surface hazards caused by coal mine, mining is, is part of our statutory obligation and obviously a responsibility which we take very seriously. Now, mentioned subsidence claims and most people think of, of damage such as this on screen. But the authority also receives claims on areas of land which could subsequently be used for development. This could lead to damage to field drains, uh, land drainage schemes or crop loss. Uh, damage could also appear as, as fissures in a, a field if deeper recorded workings have collapsed. 
This range of different damage caused by coal mining is all covered by our statutory obligations, again, here at the Coal Authority, which is one of our key responsibilities. And for any such claims that have been made within a certain boundary, uh, the consultant's report will provide full details on, on the date that the claim was made, whether or not those claims were accepted, rejected, uh, subsequently withdrawn by the claimant, or whether they're still being in investigated by us, and the value of any compensation paid or uh, the value of any repairs carried out. The report will also state whether there is a stop notice in place in relation to subsidence damage. And a stop notice is where we would expect there to be further movement or damage uh, within an 18-month period of, of receiving the subsidence claim. And because that further damage is likely to occur, we postpone or stop any repairs uh, caused by the subsidence until that movement has stopped. And finally, the report will include whether any claims have been made uh, within 50 metres or outside of the boundary supplied, and if that's the case, uh, how many claims have been made within that 50 metre area. Okay, so a bit of a, a summary of the key facts in the consultant's report. Uh, so the report can help support those undertaking development of land or of existing properties. For development in coal mining high-risk areas, uh, the report can form the basis for death studies and risk assessments, uh, which can then be supplemented with specialist ground investigations in consultation with our permissions team. Um, if planning permission in a high-risk high coal mining area is sought, then our planning department will be consulted by the local planning authority and will require a coal mining risk assessment to be undertaken, as well as any appropriate site investigation and mitigation strategy. The report provides specific details from the Coal Authority's electronic coal mining database, including full details of individual shallow workings, details of where coal seam outcrops, and suggests the probability of um, shallow but unrecorded workings. Coordinates are provided for the recorded position of mine shafts and adits, uh, and these are provided within that boundary provided, or within a, a wider 100 metre area. And this extended buffer zone, uh, compared to the 20 metre area in the CON 29M, ensures that you receive full information on mine entries uh, where the zone of influence may extend onto the site, intended by your client for development. And these reports can be turned around quickly, helping you and your clients progress through the planning and development process as efficiently as possible. The consultant's report, as well as our full suite of, of other reports, are all available to order via our online order platform at groundstability.com, with sample reports uh, for each available to download as PDF, so if you'd like to take a closer look. Equally, if you have any questions about any of the reports, please feel free to contact our team of specialists within the mining reports team at the Coal Authority, and we'll happily take the time to talk you through everything. So before we end the webinar today, uh, we've compared the CON 29M report, uh, which is a legal document drawn up through consultation with the Law Society, uh, very much for the conveyance in market with with the consultant's report in contrast, which has that slightly different approach. The consultant's report provides additional technical information as we drill down into the recorded data of the coal mine workings, the coal geology, and we provide the precise locations of those recorded mine entries. Um, and because of this technical differentiation, the approach to presenting the information is more direct. We'd really like to hear back from you and get your feedback and ideas on the different reports uh, and to get an understanding of how we can support you and your organisation. So please do let us have your feedback or if a face-to-face -face chat around these reports, especially the consultant's reports, uh, will be better for you, please get in touch with, with one of the account team. Okay, so that concludes our webinar for today. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed listening and have found the content in interesting. 
And if so, please do keep your eyes peeled for further updates and webinars uh, from the Coal Authority in the future. Uh, a quick and simple survey will appear at the end of the webinar and we'd really, really appreciate your feedback on the content delivery and anything you'd like to see in future webinars from us here at the Coal Authority. If you'd like a bit more time to reflect, uh, this survey will also be emailed out uh, tomorrow after the webinar is finished, so please do take a couple of minutes uh, to complete this as we do truly value your opinions. As I mentioned at the start, uh, we've been gathering all your questions throughout today's webinar and we'll look to supply all of these uh, with responses in the way of a handy FAQ document and this will be shared with all attendees once this month's webinar topic has been completed, which allows us to capture the questions from all of our separate sessions. If you have any other questions or comments and would like to contact me directly, uh, my details can be found on the screen now. And a recording of today's webinar will be available on our YouTube channel shortly, as I discussed before. So thank you so much for giving up your time to, to attend today, to listen and watch. And I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.